Let's read verses 10 through 13 this morning in chapter 4 of Philippians. The Apostle Paul says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of what, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Let's pray. Dear Father, I'm burdened this morning about the truth of this passage. Lord, and you know my heart. I feel unworthy to preach your word. I feel ill-equipped to proclaim your truth. But Lord, I'm thankful this morning that the power of your word is the word itself. Lord, please remove me as a distraction. Lord, help us all to focus our hearts right now on this very important truth that we struggle with from day to day that we often battle. And Lord, I'm thankful for the truths of this passage. Help them to sink deep in our hearts. Help us to learn and grow more like your son this morning. I ask these things in his name. Amen. There's a story about a, uh, from years, years ago about a rich businessman who was walking by a marina and he was disturbed to see a fisherman, a commercial fisherman, just sitting there lazily beside his boat, just sitting there. So the businessman said, why aren't you out there fishing? He he asked. The fisherman said, because I've caught enough fish for today, said the fisherman said. And uh, the businessman replied, why don't you catch more fish than you need? The fisherman said, what would I do with them? He said, well, you could earn more money. You could buy a better boat so you could go deeper and catch more fish. You could purchase nylon nets and catch even more fish and make more money. Soon you'd have a fleet of boats and you'd be rich like me. The fisherman asked, then what would I do? The businessman said, well, then you could sit down and enjoy life. The fisherman replied, What do you think I'm doing right now? Today's passage, the Apostle Paul is taking some time here and he's shifting his topic and he's commending the church in Philippi for their generosity and their care towards him. We see that in verse 10. And we're going to revisit verse 10 and and verses kind of go along with verse 14 and on. We're going to revisit them in um, in the next message. But Paul takes a rabbit trail here a divine, beneficial rabbit trail. And while he's thanking the church in Philippi for their gift, he's going to talk about a very important topic, and that topic is contentment. And uh, I I preached on this topic a little bit in one of our Christmas messages, and of course um, I was focused on that passage and didn't realize that I was going to be preaching on this topic again very soon. But I'm thankful because it's coming at it from a different direction. But this is such an important topic, isn't it? This issue of contentment. It's a topic because we seem to have built into our sinful nature discontentment, don't we? Our old flesh is quickly discontented, quickly unthankful, quickly unsatisfied. We often tell ourselves lies, don't we? I'll be content if I only had a ni- this. If I only had a nicer vehicle, I'd be content. Or if my spouse showed me more respect or whatever it is, we often hold something in our mind and in our heart and we lie to ourselves. I would be content if I had that. And how deceptive and untruthful that thought is. The truth is that we're going to see this morning is that contentment does not come by possessions. It doesn't come by just simply having willpower. Contentment is the byproduct and the result of a relationship with our Savior. That's where contentment comes. So this morning we're going to see three truths about biblical contentment. Three truths about biblical contentment if you're taking notes. Let's look at the first thing this morning. We must be content where we are. We must be content where we are. Look at with me at verse 11. 
Paul says, not that I speak in respect of want. Now that word there, want, is not like his desire. He's talking about in need. He's talking about he's not talking because he really needs something. He's not praising them for their generosity because of what he needs. Because, he says, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Notice he says, I have learned. What does that indicate about Paul in this issue of contentment? It indicates that he didn't automatically possess contentment the day he was saved. On that road to Damascus, when God miraculously saved him, Paul did not become a perfect, holy, sanctified Christian in that moment, spiritually mature, although God used him greatly. He grew And this is something, this area of contentment is something where he had to learn and grow in this. He had to develop this in his Christian life. And I encourage you all today that this is something we all need to learn and grow in, this area of contentment. In this context, Paul is specifically talking about contentment with material possessions. The church in Philippi had sent him aid had sent him possessions and and probably likely money and so he's talking that's the realm he's talking about here is he was thankful for what they gave him and this area of material possessions is an area where we are often discontented aren't we and our society and our culture encourages us to be discontented with what we have doesn't it it's part of capitalism now i love capitalism as an economic system i think it's the best option we have on earth right now. But capitalism is not perfect. And it encourages you to be discontented with what you have. And as Christians, we have to be careful about this, this materialism. I remember a couple of years ago, I, I had a laptop that was having problems. And I, I took it to this guy to try to get me to help, uh, help me fix the laptop. And I remember I got in there and he said, uh, how old is this laptop? And I said, it, it's six years old. And, and in my mind, that was a statement of youthfulness like this. Thing. And he looked at me and he started laughing. He said, why are you trying to fix it? I said, because I want it to work. And he said, that's ancient in laptop years. Six years old is old. You need to get a new, just get a new one. And I thought, no way. I expected this thing to last like at least 15 years, you know. But in our culture, in technology, in our society, we are programmed, aren't we, to upgrade. As soon as you get this for, I'm not an iPhone fan, but man, they come out with iPhones like, what are they on, 12 or 13 now? It's like constantly. The next thing, the next new model. And in our culture, we are, we are through the messaging of media and through, through all the influences we have on us, we're constantly told, you need the next thing, the newer, the better. What you have is insufficient, it's obsolete. And if we're not careful as Christians, we can become very materialistic, can't we? We absolutely need to battle that. But I don't think that that's the only thing this applies to. I think broadly this passage is talking about discontentment in our lives in various areas. And it applies widely. While Paul's focusing on material possessions, I really believe it's talking about other things. And I love what Paul says here. He says, whatsoever state I am in. We must be content where we are. And Paul's saying, right now, where you are, what you have, where you are in life right now, you need to grow in your contentment in that. I think so often, so many of us spend a lot of time looking forward to the future, don't we? You hear things like, man, I just can't wait to get my driver's license, or I just can't wait to move out of my parents. Though you don't hear that as much anymore, it seems. But, you know, it used to be everyone could not wait to move out of their parents. Or I can't wait to get married. I can't wait to have a job. And you get all those things, and then you say, I can't wait to retire, you know. We are so often looking forward to the next thing. I can't wait for that to happen. And we can grow discontented in our current situation. And, you know, those aren't necessarily bad desires, are they? It's good to want independence, and it's good to want to have a career, and it's good to want to retire when it's time for you to retire. But what can happen is we can become dissatisfied. And God does not want us focusing on the next stage of our life all the time. He want us, God wants us to focus on what you ha- what's going on right here and right now. 
And God wants you to love the people around you and minister to the people around you right now. God wants you to use the resources you have right now for his glory. Christians sometimes think, well, I'll tithe when I make a little more money. Or I'll be generous once I'm in my career and I can have more money. Or I'll spend more time with God when this happens. Or or, I'll serve God when this happens. Christian, today, if you are not serving God and growing in your relationship with God, changes in your circumstances are not going to change that. We need to focus on what God, where God has put you right now. And I think sometimes we get so distracted with what we want for the future and what, what our plans are, and we miss the fact that God has something for you right now. And this is so important for us. But I also think discontentment can go the other direction as well. At certain points in our life, if we're not careful, we can spend a lot of time looking back and wishing we were back somewhere in the past. I've known godly people who really struggled with their, the fact that they couldn't serve God the way they used to serve God. And while that's a genuine, un, you know, an understandable desire, the fact is, as Christians, we must accept God's sovereignty over the timing of our lives. And we all need to grow content in where God has us and what he has for us to do right now. Being content with where you are is saying that I may not like everything about my current circumstance, but you know what? God has a purpose for me right here, right now where I am. God wants me to grow. God wants me to minister. And God wants to work in my life right now where I am. And when Paul talks about being content exactly where he was, he was that way because he was saying, God's going to use me. And what a perfect example of a man in prison. What does he do? He writes this letter. We have this letter that he utilized his time and his resources in prison, and we are blessed because of that. Biblical contentment is not waiting for things to change. God wants you to find contentment right now. And so often we put that, oh, I will be content if this happens. And that's not biblical contentment. Biblical contentment comes exactly where you are right now. So maybe you've been fixed on something lately, a desire you have, and it's brought you some discontentment. Maybe it's a restored relationship that you really, really want that relationship to be fixed. And while that's a good desire, you must remember that God wants you to be content right now. And what does that mean? It means that if you're waiting for contentment for that thing to happen, chances are, guess what? You're not going to be content then either. And so as believers, we have to sharpen our focus, don't we? We have to step back and say, God has me here for a reason, and I'm going to grow in my contentment right now. It's a lesson that we struggle with, something we often need to be reminded. Look look at the second thing this morning. We must be content in whatever comes. Let's read verse 12. Verse 12 together. Excuse me, just a second. Verse 12 says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. There's, a, there's points in our lives where we kind of attain a level where we're, we're somewhat content, right? Right? We hit those points in our lives where we're like, you know what, I, things are going good, and I, I'm thankful for what's going on, and I'm happy, and I'm satisfied with my current situation. And it's good, but true biblical contentment, see, is not based off your circumstances. And what Paul's saying here is true biblical contentment, you're... You're going to be content when things are abounding, when you have prosperity and abundance, and you're also going to be content when you're suffering need. See, if you say, well, I'm content right now the way things are, that's not great because guess what? They're not going to stay that way, are they? Life is full of change and disappointment and loss. And so instead of searching for that contentment in your current situation, we need to grow in building a contentment that is content in Christ whatever comes. Paul is saying here that the contentment he has learned is something that remains consistent in good times and in bad times. 
It's contentment that's not dependent on the circumstances. As I was thinking about this idea of contentment in this passage, I was thinking that I think we sometimes have a wrong view of contentment. I think what we think is that if we don't want anything, that means we're content. Like, I don't want it. Right now, I don't want anything. So I'm content. You know, I got everything I wanted for Christmas, so I'm content. No, that's not biblical contentment. See, we know from the epistles that Paul had many desires, didn't he? He ex- often expressed how he wanted to visit these churches. He wanted them to be unified and have, have you know, unity in the church. He wanted to um, see them grow. Paul expressed many desires. It wasn't like Paul didn't want anything. That's not what's going on here. Biblical contentment is not the lack of desire. So what is contentment? If Paul wanted many things, and yet he's saying here that he's content, what does that mean? I believe that as you think about this, true biblical contentment, and Paul's contentment here, is trusting God's timing and trusting God's provision. Trusting God's timing and trusting God's provision provision. That means what we do, what we want something, which we all want things, right? There's all th- there's good desires, there's bad desires, but we all have desires. But what we need to do as believers is we filter all of our desires through the lens of trusting God. We filter all of our wants through the reality that God is in control of the timing of our life. For the Apostle Paul, this meant recognizing that being stoned, being whipped, being shipwrecked, being imprisoned, all of those things were part of God's plan. You know, but also Paul here, he takes time to emphasize that he's learned to be content in times of abundance. Did you know that that's hard too? So often when we have prosperity in our lives, when things are going well, we wander into discontentment, don't we? And you would think that would be the opposite. you think, well, when you have everything, when things are going great, then you're content. But so often we become discontented. Like, when things are bad, I trust you, Lord. You're praying and you're like, you're really leaning into the, you know, church attendance and loving people. And you're like, man, I really need encouragement. And then when things start going good, you start thinking, oh, I got this. And suddenly... Your dependence on God decreases and suddenly you find yourself discontented. So we need to learn to be content, with God, be content in God in both abundance and in need is what Paul is saying here. We need to be content in both, situa- both situations. I saw a video the other day. It was pretty amazing. It just came up on YouTube and I watched this video. It was a news broadcaster. I think it was about 10 years old or 5 years old. This news broadcaster was working, you know, giving the news, and then he said at the end, hey, I have an announcement. I just want to tell you all that my cancer, my brain cancer is back, and the doctors have told me I have six months to live. And he stayed completely calm, and and he said, I just want you all to know that I'm a born-again Christian, and I'm at peace. And I was like, wow, wow, what an awesome testimony. So, but I watched that video and then I scrolled down in the comments and comment after comment after comment. People are amazed at how this guy could stay so calm when he has this terminal diagnosis and he could have peace and be so content in his situation. Folks, true biblical contentment that we get from Jesus Christ, it can weather the valleys and the mountaintops. Because it's not based on circumstances, it's based in faith and trust in God. Do you have that kind of contentment today? You know, it's impossible. You know, this point is we must, we must be content in whatever comes, right? That's the idea here, Paul is saying. But how do you know how you're going to respond with whatever comes? Well, you don't, right? You don't know what's going to come, first of all. And you don't know how you're going to respond either, right? So how do, we, how do we build a contentment that is content no matter what comes? That's the whole idea that Paul is saying here is our contentment has to be separated from our circumstances. Our contentment has to be one that is fixed on something that is true and is consistent, and that is Jesus Christ. 
So I ask you, have you been struggling in this area of contentment in, in one way or another in your life? Today is a good opportunity for you to assess, am I content? And is my contentment going to continue no matter what happens? Let's look at the third thing this morning, this awesome verse 13. The third truth about contentment this morning is we must be dependent on Christ. We must be dependent on Christ. Let's look at verse 13. Most of you can probably say this by memory. The verse says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So what we see here in this passage is the Apostle Paul is taking this divine rabbit trail to talk about contentment. And he says to them, first of all, you need to learn to be content where you are. That, he's saying, I've learned to be content exactly where I am. And I've learned to be content in all circumstances that come, the good ones and the bad ones. So what you would expect from the Apostle, the next thing, is you would expect him to give them some, in, some insight. How do we get this contentment? Wow, Paul, you've learned to be content where you are. And obviously it's true because you're in prison and you have a great attitude and you're modeling this truth. So how do, how do you do that, Paul? And you might expect him to say, well, you know, maybe you'd think he would say, well, focus on spiritual things more than material things. That would be some good advice. Maybe you'd expect him to say, make sure you're not coveting earthly possessions. That would be some good advice as well. But Paul doesn't say any of that. What Paul says is, I can do all these things through Christ who gives me strength. The Apostle Paul is saying that through a relationship with Jesus Christ, he is strengthened to live through both the times of suffering and the times of abundance and to do them with contentment. This passage right here, verse 13, is one of the most misused and abused verses in all of Scripture. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this verse has been used for so many inappropriate settings. And, and really, that's sad. And as Christians, we need to be careful. This verse is not saying that if you really put your mind to it, you can win your Little League game, you know, I can, or your football game, or whatever it is. Or if you really put your mind to it, you'll be successful in the next business venture because Christ's going to give you strength. That's not what it's saying. The context is saying simply... Christ will give you the strength to have contentment in your life no matter what comes. It is saying you could be strengthened to find contentment in every season of life. The verse is not just a formula to contentment. It's a statement of faith. A statement of faith. Think about what Paul means when he says this. He says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. He's saying that he has faith in God's ability to work in his situation. He has faith that God is involved in his situation. He has faith that God cares about him, that God has a plan, that God's going to accomplish this plan. Paul here is saying that he has contentment because he is depending on Jesus Christ. I said in the beginning of the message that our flesh naturally is discontented, isn't it? And if you dig deep inside and try to get contentment, you're not going to find it. Just like happiness and satisfaction, contentment is not something you can just search for that one thing and then you can get it. If your goal in life is to be happy and content, guess what? You're not going to be happy and content. Happiness and contentment and satisfaction, they're byproducts of living out your God-given purpose. They're byproducts of a relationship with the Savior. So when Paul says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, he's saying, I know that whatever comes my way is part of God's plan. It's under God's control, and God is using it for his glory, and I can be content with that. He's saying he is dependent on Christ for his contentment. Christian, this morning, can you say that? Are you dependent on Christ for your contentment? Or are you seeking contentment in other places? We often do that, don't we? We know in our head that Christ gives satisfaction and contentment and purpose, and yet we fail to seek him for it. We go to other places. When Misty and I were in South Carolina at our church, it was really amusing before the 
before the service because there was three or four people in this church that gave, that gave candy to the children. And those kids knew who those people were. So before church, you could watch these, you know, 15, 20 kids making their rounds every service. They would go to this person and ask for candy and this person and ask for candy. And I was helping in the sound room, and one of the candy people worked in the sound room. So before the service, these kids would be running in and, and, uh, you know, excited what they're going to get. And a lot of them would say, hey, can I get a piece for my brother or sister? And they would give them extra. I'm thinking, there ain't no way they're going to see that. You know, that's getting eaten before it gets to them. You know, but you would watch just this train of kids rotating around. You know what was funny? Those kids never asked me for candy. Ever. You know why? I didn't have any candy to give them. I didn't have any. They knew where the candy was coming from. And they beelined from one part of the auditorium to the other part of the auditorium, up to the balcony, to the sound room, back down to the other area. And they were trying to make their rounds before the service started. They went to the source of where they knew it was. And Christian, you and I know, we know in here, that our contentment and our satisfaction is from one person. It's from Jesus Christ. And yet, how often are we running around, seeking it in relationship, seeking it in possession, seeking it in popularity, seeking it in hobbies, seeking it in whatever, you fill in the blank. How often are we seeking this contentment that Paul is talking about, and we're seeking it from the wrong place? Paul's making it really clear here. True biblical contentment comes from Christ. He strengthens us in the good times, and he strengthens us in the difficult times. Maybe you're here today, and if you're being honest, you would admit that you're struggling with discontentment lately. Maybe you fixated on something, hoping it will bring you contentment. I want to encourage you this morning to shift your focus. Shift your focus from whatever that thing is, that thing that you really, really want. And I'm not saying it's a bad desire, but it's not going to bring you contentment. Shift your focus to Jesus Christ. How do you do that? It's really easy to say stuff like that, but how do you practically do that? Can I just encourage you to go to God and pray about it? Tell God exactly what you've been wanting. Confess to him. Say, God, I've been trying to reach satisfaction through this thing, and it's not working. Then ask God to forgive you for that. Admit to him that you've grown discontented. And here's the next thing I would encourage you to do. Ask God what he wants you to do. You know that much of our joy and contentment as believers comes in serving the Lord? And so ask God, 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 what do you have for me? Because the Lord has something as a child of God. If you're here today and you're truly saved, God has something for you to do in the body of Christ. Maybe he wants you to encourage somebody. Maybe he wants you to witness to a lost person. Maybe he wants you to pray for a certain thing. Whatever it is, ask God, say, God, what do you want me to do? And then ask God to help you to do it and find joy and contentment in that. That's some practical advice for you this morning. I don't know who's here, and I don't know your heart. I don't know the details of your thought life this last week. But if you've been struggling in this area of contentment, God wants you to be content right now. And he wants you to be content with him. And he wants you to grow content, a contentment that can handle the changes that come in life. So I want to just close with a couple quick questions. Have you learned contentment? Paul said he learned this. Have you as a Christian, have you grown in this area and learned to be content? Secondly, I want to ask you this morning, how are you doing trusting God's timing in your life? We struggle with that, don't we? We say, Lord, I know you're going to do it, but I want it now. Right now I want it. Contentment comes when we say, God, I trust your plan and I trust your timing. Thirdly tonight or this morning, I just want to ask you, are you going to the right source of contentment? 
Are you going to the right source of contentment? What you need this morning is not a change of circumstances. What we all need and what you need this morning is a change in your heart. And God can give you that this morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, as your children, you've adopted us. We have you as our heavenly father. You have given us a purpose, a mission. You've given us a family in the body of Christ. Lord, you've blessed us abundantly. Lord, forgive us when we've tried to find contentment in other places. Forgive us, Lord, when we've tried to create contentment and satisfaction ourselves apart from you and apart from your word, apart from your son. Lord, I don't know the needs in every heart here, Lord. I don't know the situations. But Lord, I just pray this morning that you would, with your Holy Spirit, that you would convict in hearts. Lord, there's probably somebody here who is thinking they will have contentment when the next thing they desire comes. Lord, wake us up from that deception. Wake us up from that lie that we will be content later. Help us to realize that we need to base our contentment in you. Lord, please work in hearts this morning. Reveal your will, Lord. Help us to get busy doing your service and finding our joy in you. Bless this time as we meditate on these truths. Help us to respond in our hearts. Help us to make changes, to think biblically, and to be doers of the word. I ask this in your son's name. Amen. With every head bowed, I want to give you an opportunity to talk to God about this. If the Holy Spirit's convicting you specifically about something, a desire you have, that you've been, maybe not even purposely, but you've been saying to yourself, if I only had this. I want to give you an opportunity this morning to give that thing to God and to admit to him that that will not bring you contentment. And ask God to help you to have contentment in him this morning. Give you some time to pray. Amen. Thank you for your good attention this morning. It's hard, isn't it? I don't know about you, but you, I, I often get something fixed in my head, in my heart. Even if I don't realize it, I'm seeking fulfillment and happiness from other things. And they never fulfill, do they? Maybe for just a few minutes, but it doesn't last. Folks, we need to anchor our lives and our joy in Jesus Christ. Let's work on that. Let's grow and let's learn to grow in that area. Pastor, we dismiss us in prayer.